What's going on guys? My name is Alden Hero and welcome to episode 97 of the Midnight Hour. We upload on Saturdays now because I think going forward what I'm going to do is just throw the episode up whenever we've recorded it so it won't be on a set day anymore. I don't know. Let me know what you think of that idea as a whole. Um, some other podcasters that I listen to do it and it actually kind of makes sense but it's also cool because you get like a nice little surprise in your podcast inbox which... I think everyone gets every time I upload anything anyway. Um, What will follow me talking here will just be the standard interview and then the episode, sorry, standard introduction and then the episode, which is myself and Dr. John. Um, There's a pretty flashy title for this episode. Um, It's kind of hard to categorize, I guess, Um, but we do talk about a lot in it. Um, Start off talking about the brain Uh, just things that hold the brain together and how they can fall apart. Um, We talk about social anxiety and then kind of like economic slash political anxiety and the elements that combine to sort of catalyze and even foster uh, just general modern day existential dread that if you go on Twitter, it will feel like everybody around you is depressed. Whereas if you go on Facebook, it seems like everybody is really happy. And that's a really interesting paradigm. And I sort of really want to know like why that is. But we do kind of a deep dive here. Um, I think the title of the episode just showcases how much we stray off topic. But I actually think everything we said was on topic in some nebulous way. Uh, Everything that we talk about here is combined somehow. Also, towards the end of the episode, you will hear me giving some uh, tips on like how to deal with social anxiety. And I actually think that section like alone is worth listening to. So if the rest of the episode like doesn't really take your fancy or whatever, maybe just skip to the end and check that bit out. But anyway, um, up next is going to be whatever intro I make. I haven't made it yet. I hope you guys enjoy the episode. Um, if you do leave a like you know subscribe rate comment all of that good stuff check out the subreddit which i haven't mentioned in ages links will be in the description and hey christmas is coming if you want to buy a t-shirt off uh, society six uh, or any kind of midnight hour merch like a mug or a flag or (laughs) literally anything um check those things out in the description all right peace I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under the counter. Punks are running wild in the street. There's nobody anywhere who seems to know what to do and there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. They're crazy. It's like everything everywhere is going crazy, so we don't go out anymore. We sit in the house, and slowly the world we're living in is getting smaller, and all we say is, please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to ride. I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflation and the Russians and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it. My life has value. So, I want you to get up now. I want all of you to get up out of your chairs. I want you to get up right now and go to the window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore! I want you to get up right now. Sit up, go to your windows, open them and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell and I'm not going to take this anymore! No power in the verse can stop me. I'm joined today by Dr. John, returning to the podcast after a hiatus of at least three weeks, possibly. Terrible. terrible. Yeah, long, long time. So, uh, thanks for coming back. Thanks Um, for having me. I had to double your fee for some reason. Uh, I guess we're not going to talk about that on the air, but uh, whatever it is I said, I'm sorry. And if we could just give... (laughs) I don't know why I decided to say all of that stuff. Um, But yeah, no, thanks for coming back. Um, 
Today we're going to talk about some heavy topics, I guess. Um, it's not something that we have fully fleshed out and uh, we're very much going to shoot from the hip, but a comment was left on a previous episode about how social media affects your psyche, and it was a guy just asking if we could talk about social anxiety, and I don't really know under what context we can do that, but um, I just want to make an effort to talk about it because I actually have a lot to say on the topic and I also have mm. what I believe are some good tips to uh, sort of sort yourself out um, in that sense. And I don't mean that in a, hey man, just get over it kind of way because I am yeah, no, definitely, yeah. definitely not one of those people. So John, when you're depressed, you should just get over it. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> depression is a modern uh, product of the mainstream media trying to kind of... <laughs> Make it fashionable to feel bad and sad. You guys should all go and check out a video by a YouTuber called Paul Joseph Watson <laughs> called The Truth About Depression. And oh, I know. Take, it's terrible, isn't it? Take everything that he says and put it in a bin. And, uh, yeah. No, it's, it's one of the worst takes I've ever seen. Um, yeah. It's so insensitive, but so insensitive in a way that's just so unscientific and inaccurate. You know what I mean? It's not even funny. It's not even You know useful. what it is, John? It's, it's not trash. funny. It's punk rock. <laughs> it's counterculture. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah, no, but for real, um, we're going to try and keep it as lighthearted as possible because it's such a heavy mm. topic and it's something that like everybody has either gone through or know someone who's gone through like statistically one in four people will have experienced some form of depression at some point in their life yeah 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 um so yeah we will try to make jokes because that's how we deal with things um but anyway uh dr john's going to tell us a little bit about the brain and i think this will give some context to those people who do genuinely think that people just need to get over it and i will say yeah. a lot is made about that about that stance and while i do think it's deplorable to shove that position in someone's face when they're going through a tough time if you don't go through depression like let's face it it is quite a difficult thing to comprehend if it's not something you've ever experienced in your life i would imagine mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but still fuck those people like just so we're clear um but, yeah yeah so tell us about the brain it's in the head is that correct? <laughs> some people's yeah uh so the reason I want to start with the brain is just because I think it's important to contextualize mental health and like the best place to start is kind of a firm bedrock from which then we can sort of like plant some seeds, see what grows and then just kind of walk around the garden of our do own doing. So in relation to the brain, there's 100 billion neurons kind of obviously that's a ridiculous number. No one's ever counted them all as far as I know, but we can infer that based on weight of samples and then kind of multiplying and stuff like that. Obviously, the amount of neurons throughout different parts of the brain varies. I think one of the highest density uh, parts of the brain with uh, in relation to neurons is the cerebellum, which basically controls your balance. Um, so when you're moving around in space, the fact that you don't fall over or don't fall over as much as you normally would is down to, say, for instance, cerebellum. And it uh, kind of deals with a lot of things, your body in space and orienting that body to itself and to other things and stuff like that. But anyway, 100 billion neurons, which is a ridiculous thing to try and uh, imagine. But then we move on to kind of the more interesting number, which is basically the number of connections within the brain. So if you want to think of the brain as being uh, composed of these kind of railroad tracks, they'd be the neurons. If you think of a railroad track and the part of the railroad track where it merges with another one, so like, you know, a train might be on one track and then get shifted over to another one, like with those kind of metal connector things. Yeah. That's a synapse. So a synapse is a connection between two neurons. So we actually have 100 trillion synapses, which is like, as far as I know, that's about like a thousand times the number of neurons we have. So that's about a thousand connections for every neuron, which is absolutely ridiculous. And they think that there's a good evidence that synapses are essentially the way we remember things so that when our brain is firing, the electrochemical impulse is traveling along the axon, which is like the body of the nerve, and then it creates or joins with other nerves. And then when those happen enough, a phenomenon called Hebbian learning occurs. And this basically uh, sort of ensures that when neurons wire together, they fire together. And then that kind of keeps the loop going. And that's how memories essentially they think are formed or in some sort of vague way, although the kind of memory consolidation uh, means hasn't been fully fleshed out. 
But then as well as that, like that same kind of lump of matter is only about 1.3 to 1.4 kilograms, which is kind of ridiculous. When you think about all the like high tech computers and stuff we have, what our brain can do versus what like the best supercomputer of the time can do. Like, I don't know if you saw that. Um, was it in Saudi Arabia? They showed off that like artificial intelligence computer in the form of a female woman. And a female woman? Yes. Yeah, what is this? <laughs> in the form of a well, I suppose female it could be it could be a female girl. Okay. Uh, could be. Yeah, it could have been a female. It could be dog. just a girl or a woman. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's like uh, in I think it was Saudi Arabia or something like that. But apparently she's been given citizenship there. So like she essentially has more rights than actual like in, in certain ways other Saudi Arabian women. I was sort of just ridiculous. about to say that, yeah. She, yeah. She's been given citizenship in a country where they don't allow women to drive. If anything, that just sums up how terrible they are at human rights. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How funny though if they're like, okay, but she has to wear a burqa and it's actually just a woman, not a robot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, it's like, look at what this robot can do. But anyway, no, uh, that's stupid. Uh, but okay, so the brain is only like, so like if you think about a kilo of sugar, like our brain isn't much heavier than that. Like it's absolutely ridiculous. What <laughs> Sorry, can do. I can't stop laughing at the idea that it's just a woman. <laughs> and they've just figured out that women are humans. <laughs> Whoa! <Yeah. laughs> This one can yeah. talk. And, oh. Yeah, it took like 200 years since the Industrial Revolution to, like, uh, science to culminate in creating an artificially intelligent woman to show that women are not artificially intelligent, but actually <laughs> intelligent. <laughs> yeah, so we have an, an AI artificial intelligent robot, and then it's like AI actually intelligent woman. <laughs> They're only now uh, conflating the two. It, 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 it took science to create <laughs> some, <laughs> something in the shape of a woman that could like show intelligence to actually infer that, okay, maybe actual women are intelligent. I bet this is why Saudi Arabia have just allowed women to drive on the road. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Nope. Basically, when they're about to launch driverless cars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, they get all the, like, show bonus, like, look how progressive we are. Okay, now we're going to make a law that says that only driverless cars are allowed in this country. Man, like, I, the next day I after the uh, DUI rate goes up. Or, no, it wouldn't be DUI. It would just be kind of, yeah, fender benders. Anyway, why do you keep pulling me off the brain, the most interesting thing in the known universe? Because the brain so, um, is where the funnies come from. <laughs> that's that's why we're all really here. Yeah. Um, How many synapses in a funny? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, yeah, you have um, yeah a lot of funny synapses. All right, so there's four lobes to the brain, each kind of responsible for different sort of perceptual and motor components. Like each kind of has its own personality, for want of a better word. It's, it's absolutely bizarre. Like if you were just looking at it grossly, you wouldn't be able to tell anything different. But the fact that like we see things with our occipital cortex, we hear things with our temporal, like these are grossly different, you know what I mean, subjective uh, perceptions. But from a like a microscopic view or a very scientific view, there's not really, as far as we can tell, you know what I mean, under the microscope, differences between them. So again, it's just the brain is uh, absolutely extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And then like we've got things called neurotransmitters. So I mentioned earlier that the neurons uh, kind of transport an electrochemical signal. So the electro is obviously just kind of um, the movement of electricity within the neurons. But then the chemical is like a various neurotransmitters. And some people have heard about like dopamine, kind of the rewarding transmitter. Then like we have... Um, epinephrine, which would be like adrenaline and then uh, norepinephrine and stuff like that. So there's like a variety of different ones. There's like GABA, there's glutamine, and they, they all like perform very, a variety of different functions. Can we like talk about a... epinephrine for a second? Um, yes. And just the power of, of adrenaline. Um, and how yeah. it, it basically gives you this superhuman, like, one-off like, god mode basically yeah, in your yeah. body. It's insane. There is a true story um, that often gets sort of mocked um, a, as fake, but it, it's a thing that really happened. Was uh, a woman her her child had been run over by a car, and the car was on top of her kid, and she lifted the car off of her kid, and it was yeah. like proven that this was like not an amount of like th this car weighed so much that it it would be impossible for like pretty much anybody to lift. Not anybody, obviously, but. Certainly, a woman of her size and stature, yeah, um, yeah, and and like she could never repeat that, 
Uh, just her adrenaline kicked in and that somehow enabled her to lift a fucking car. And that yeah. will just never stop <clears throat> blowing my mind that that's a thing that can actually happen. Is that you get a sufficient emotional response. Yeah. That it enables you to yeah. do things that... Ha, like, I, I don't even understand how it works. Like, how yeah. how did her body produce the the strength or, or like what is it like the fortitude or whatever to just mm. uh, that's that's crazy to me i just like there is definitely some kind of um potential that is kind of locked in everybody and like you need adrenaline to just get it out sometimes or something yeah like it uh, from a physiological point of view so adrenaline obviously the word adrenaline comes from the fact that uh, it's the adrenal glands which are the primary source of adrenaline and they sit right on top of the kidneys and the function of it, obviously, it's kind of the stress hormone in that, like, uh, well, no, I won't call it that. I'll call it the fight or flight hormone. Oh, yes. So when you're presented with a dangerous or violent or sort of uh, unexpected event where you really need to get out of there quick, adrenaline is released. And the effect that has on the body is fascinating. So what you want, basically, when you're under pressure is for your heart to beat fast and your lungs to take in oxygen. Oxygen will help with the aerobic respiration, increase energy, and the heart beating fast will transport that oxygen around the body. And adrenaline does all that like by itself. It'll make the heart contract harder. It'll also open up the coronary arteries, which supply blood to the heart, make sure that the heart is well perfused, high energy. And then it'll also dilate the uh, blood vessels to the lungs, meaning that the kind of the ability of the lungs to transfer oxygen from the air into our bloodstream is enhanced. So like from a physiological perspective, the effect of adrenaline is just incredible. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. There's a, there's a guy, he's called the Iceman. Um, don't know his real name. He's Dutch. Um, he has this like breathing technique that, in some way enables him to control his own adrenaline and to the mm. best of science's knowledge he's the only person ever who's been able to do that um okay. i saw a vice documentary about him and thought well this is bullshit it's on vice um <laughs> but then i looked it up and and the dude holds like some ridiculous number of guinness world records including stuff like the longest time submerged in um ice water uh, along with loads of other stuff but because he's able to control his adrenaline it helps his ability to withstand the cold and he just he goes swimming in like those icy lakes you know where it's like they're, they're literally frozen over like he likes to go swimming in yeah. places like that um he he climbed like i think 10 kilometers up mount everest in only his shorts um oh he climbed kilimanjaro in only his shorts i don't know if that's significant or not because i don't know i genuinely don't know if it's hot or cold up kilimanjaro it could literally be either <laughs> but yeah um, yeah yeah, it's he. He just has this, uh, just just this unfathomable ability to control his own adrenaline, and um, he's like a, a one-off, like a, a, just a case study, like a. Yeah, yeah. A Marvel. Um, what what country is he from? Did you say? I believe he's from the Netherlands, and if he's not from there, he definitely lives there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And he's got like basically a conscious control over his adrenal glands. Yeah, it's like he does this uh, weird breathing thing where it's like. You breathe in all the way, like you inhale as much as you possibly can, and then mm -hmm. you inhale some more, and you keep inhaling until you go into some weird euphoric state. Evidently, I don't know what his specific technique is. I I'd recommend everyone watch the documentary. Just type in Vice the Iceman. It's not very long. Um, yeah. And, uh, I mean, take it with a pinch of salt, right? It's Vice. But um, yeah. go check out his Wikipedia page after, because they will cite all of his all of the legitimate... Um, like medical studies that have been done on him um it's class yeah oh yeah they did some other weird shit where he so he accessed the control over his adrenaline and they injected him with loads of diseases like meningitis and and some other stuff and his body fought it off like no other yeah. person has done before god i completely forgot about that that was probably the most interesting part of the whole thing um yeah his his adrenaline's fight over disease is like fucking insane like nothing they've ever seen before um that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Like, I always notice that when I'm really stressed and stuff, like, in the moment, I don't get sick. But then as soon as the stress resolves, say, like, exams in college or whatever, and then I'm relaxing, that's when it, like, catches up with me and I actually get sick. I get run down. You know what I mean? I get a cough. I get a cold or whatever. Yeah, I but get migraines. in the migraines. moment when I'm... The same idea. Yeah, yeah. Migraines are actually interesting physiologically as well. Um, oh, they're, like, they're not very around. well understood, but, like, yeah, they're crippling. 
Oh, they're ridiculous. Um, yeah, I, I kind of, I have spoken a little bit about them before, but it, it just, it will never stop blowing my mind and terrifying me. In literally. Measure that, yeah, but but just the fact that I, I will literally forget everything about myself and I will try to speak and words that come out will be completely different. It's mad. It, it's cr- like I tried to say television one time and I said Hollywood and I just couldn't reconcile the differences between the two words. And then the yeah. fact that I couldn't, get the words out properly made me start to cry and like it's like i just have no control over this as it's happening to me it's nuts yeah i remember when i was studying neuroscience um the leading theory at the time was that migraines were basically a result of cerebrovascular uh blood flow so say for instance the vessels supplying the brain uh they constrict and it would actually be when they dilate again that that's when the migraine would be caused yeah and also that's right. migraines are correlated with uh, hangovers. So people who get really bad migraines are generally more predisposed to bad hangovers um, than people who don't get migraines. Like I never get headaches. I'm really, really lucky. The only time I might get a headache is if I'm super dehydrated, yeah. and that's like a really horrible headache. Like that's like kind of a hollow headache that just won't go no matter what you do. Like I find that so like basically yeah, I just I just can't let myself get dehydrated. But that's the only time I get them. It wouldn't be a migraine. It wouldn't be stress headache or anything like that. But yeah, headaches are weird. I get stress pains like everywhere in my body, but um, the most notable place I get them, actually I won't say, but I'm sure you can imagine where it is, and uh, it's really weird. <laughs> and uh, stress is so, like some people have like stress-induced back pain and stuff. Oh yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I have had that before, but never to like a really strong degree, but. Um, yeah, I get fucking chronic stress pain. Not chronic in the actual yeah, yeah, like, yeah. medical sense of the word, but like I do get some really bad stress pain sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, there's a really strong correlation between chronic depression and chronic pain. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And that's like what's fueling the opioid ec- epidemic that you might hear about in the news, especially in the United States. And Donald Trump came out there, I think, recently saying that he wants to try and combat that. And like the cost to the taxpayer is huge. The cost to the like to society is huge. You know what I mean? Like these things actually have uh, huge effects on people, society, and and everything. Like it, they're not a good thing to be on opioids. Yeah, Chris Christie described it as a nine eleven every two weeks. Yeah, like it's terrible. Like, and um, they're so addictive, and people find it so hard to get off them, and then they drop out of work, and then yeah, like it's it, it's a spiral. I it's can awful. say, having been on opioids, and this is like a horrible thing to say and in bad taste, but like I totally get why people are addicted to them. Like, yeah, like yeah. I, I I had some really bad pain after uh, surgery a, a few years ago, and oh my god, if it weren't for tramadol. Um, mm-hmm. like Jesus, that like that is an insanely intense yeah. pain relief drug that well, gives tra- you well, a, yeah. Basically, you go into like a euphoric semi sleep state, and it's just it's just incredible. Like, well, the fact you bring up tramadol is interesting because <clears throat> the tramadol spe- like isn't specifically an opioid. It's not one. So an, an opioid, uh, just to get technical, opiate would be heroin. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Would be an opiate. Opioid yeah, morphine, is something that. I mean, yeah, it's similar to, like, it's like it but isn't. That's basically what the suffix oid means. It's like it but isn't. So an opioid isn't that's like heroin but isn't. It's like a synthetic version. But tramadol is very interesting, and the fact that you bring up, like, euphoric state kind of makes, like, yeah, it makes me want to talk about the kind of um, pharmacology of it. So it's not just opioid effect. It also has um, interesting neurotransmitter effects. So you know the way, like, SSRIs, SNRIs, I guess, Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they yeah. affect like the neurochemistry of the brain. Tramadol actually affects the neurochemistry of the brain. It's not just affecting the pain receptors in like the spinal cord and, and that sort of thing. It's actually affecting brain neurochemistry. I've never been on the stuff myself, but I totally understand where, what you're getting at when you talk about euphoric state. That's interesting because um, I I've been on I've been on an SSRI, and mm. <clears throat> when you Take an SSRI, it takes a few weeks to actually do anything. Um, mm. Well, no, that's not true. It, it takes a few weeks to do what it's supposed to do. Um, but <laughs> in the build-up from when you're waiting for it to actually start working, um, you feel like 150 times worse in like all sorts of different states. Um, mm. it, it basically just gives you... It, like If you take an SSRI for anxiety, right, which is popular, um, that's a popular prescription in... 
um, the Republic of Ireland and in, it's first line treatment yeah. yeah in in Spain and Portugal and stuff like that everywhere else it's actually uh, an antidepressant for major depressive episodes um, which is interesting because I, I, I like th- those are two completely different things but they prescribe the exact same thing in varying yeah, quantities yeah. for each disorder um, but when you take an SSRI um, you just spend weeks it's it basically takes all of your anxiety that you had already multiplies it by 10 um, and then when you actually get on it uh, any if you drink like one can of coke at like nine o'clock in the morning you better believe you're not getting to sleep that night you're just going to sit there like wide awake it's pretty i i actually would not recommend ssris for anybody mm-hmm. especially if you're under the age of 25 hmm i'd have to say yeah it it's important to note that that could be an el Nero specific effect that's true, but I've looked it up, and there's a there's this really popular thing called the Citalopram Survival Guide, and mm. like everyone comes back to this talking about, especially when you're just when you have to taper off um, the medication, you have to like taper it down eventually to to like wean yourself off it. Um, yeah. It's such a horrible experience. And yeah, like it, it is specific to me, like other people, it might actually be the thing that keeps them going or, or whatever. So I, yeah, yeah, I shouldn't yeah. say I like, broadly don't recommend them. That's pretty reckless. But I, I also know other people who have had more or less the same or worse experience than me. Um, yeah, but, but in, but, but in, in, in fairness, the, there are a lot of people who, who do benefit from it. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. Like, yeah, uh, it is important to realize that these aren't just a, a band-aid for your mental health. They're not a cure-all. And they don't just do good things. Like these are drugs that affect your brain chemistry. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Just, I just yeah. I, I thought like it, you know one of the worst and most reckless things about an SSRI for me is that if you're under the age of 25 and you go on it, it makes you more likely to kill yourself for the first six weeks or something like that. Um, like that that's just ridiculous. And and, it, and then it has the the exact same effect when you're coming off it. It's only prevalent in people under the age of 25. But I know somebody that it happened to, and I was like, that's ridiculous. I didn't have anything like that. And I looked it up, and it says um, people under the age of 25 are at a higher risk of suicide within the first six weeks of being on an SSRI. It's like, mm. that, that's, that seems like counterintuitive. Like, oh, you want to kill yourself? Well, here's a drug that will enhance the probability that that's going to happen. But then, you know, if you pass that, if you pass that realm, then you start to well, feel a little bit better. Okay, so, so I always think things like that can be very hard to wrap your head around. Like, I think statistics in general is poorly appreciated by human beings just because it's a very sort of, like, you, humans deal with heuristics. It's sort of like, oh, um, I was beaten up by so-and-so this time, so now people who look like that person I'm going to avoid or whatever. You know what I mean? We take cognitive shortcuts, and we don't really like to do the cognitive arithmetic that would generally arrive at the right conclusion all the time because yeah. it's mentally taxing. It's also, we taxing. just evolved to not do that, like... Yeah, yeah. So, for instance, what I was going to get at is, say, for instance, if we take 100 patients in an SSRI study, and I'm garbling these statistics, but I'm just doing it as a thought experiment. And say, for instance, people who don't go on SSRIs, uh, 50 stay the same, and then, say, 49 get worse and one kills themselves. So that's a suicide of one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, people who are depressed and take an SSRI. Say, for instance, if 98 get better, but now two kill themselves. Right. That's a doubling in the suicide risk. But look at the benefit in relation to all those other people. Just to put in context, you, you know, what I mean, it's not just a case of, oh, so sure, people are getting better as well, but there's more death. There's also like an inordinate amount of positive from it as well. Yeah, that's true. Does that make sense? No, but, yeah, totally. I, yeah. But as a statistic, you're right. Like, yeah, your chance of suicide goes up, I believe, um, on them, which is frightening because you think it should have a complete opposite effect. Yeah, it's I, I I as I was coming off the SSRI, I just found it really yeah, alarming yeah. that it, it that it has such a profound impact on your. And why wouldn't it though, as well? Like you know, what I mean, like you're altering brain chemistry. Or, like, it's an integral part of the, the constitution of our brains. You yeah. know what I mean? And all of a sudden, this thing that's been like, yeah, um, yeah, an SSRI yeah. for anyone who doesn't know it, it's this thing that. So it's a drug you go on, you take a certain amount um, of it every day, and it sort of, it, it's called a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, and it basically controls the amount of serotonin that your brain, you, you know what, John, you can probably explain this better than me. Yeah. It, it's yeah. a manual way of, of uh, controlling your brain chemistry. 
Yeah, so basically when our uh, synapses, the connections between neurons we talked about before, they release things called neurotransmitters in vesicles. So a vesicle is like a bubble and the neurotransmitter is in there. And then when the bubble gets to the surface of the synapse, it sort of pops and then out comes the neurotransmitter. But then obviously we don't want the effect of that neuron to continue. So our bodies obviously have developed ingenious ways to stop the effects and it kind of sucks up or breaks down or transports away the neurotransmitter. But what we think about depression is, is that it's linked to a low amount of serotonin in the synapse. So what we've done is we found drugs that will basically enhance the level of serotonin at the level of the synapse. And the way we enhance it is we stop the reuptake of serotonin. So a selective serotonin, selective just means it's specific to serotonin, serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Um, and that basically will ensure that there's more serotonin in, available to the brain. Uh, when you're on the drug. But there's two really interesting things that I'd like to talk about in relation specifically to SSRIs. The first is, is that if you actually look at brain matter before and after being on serotonin, you'll see that there's actually more dendritic processes coming out of the neurons after they've been stimulated with SSRIs. And what dendritic processes are, are like these little branches that come out of the neuron and basically give it sort of feelers. And obviously then that's kind of growth of the neuron and it shows that the neurons being stimulated, that it's not kind of breaking down or dying, which there actually is evidence that during strong depressive episodes, we, we do lose brain mass. It's not a significant amount, but if you look at the hippocampus, the part of the brain dedicated to memory, that will actually shrink during depressive episodes, especially for extended periods of time. And we have this kind of uh, a phenomenon called, I'm not sure the exact name, but it's basically people who are depressed almost seem like they have a cognitive disability at times. They can't remember things. They can't interact. They're not like doing well at their job. For all intents and purposes, it's like they've had some sort of uh, cognitive uh, like problem, something happening in their brain. But when you put them on SSRIs, you actually find that the, the brain matter flourishes back to, say, normal standards, which is really interesting that something like that is having such a profound effect on the brain matter itself, not just the mood or the subjective experience of the person. The second point I want to make is that serotonin actually has an important uh, role in another part of our body as well as our brain in our gut. Um, and if I'm remembering it correctly, the gut, so for instance, the connection from the mouth to the anus, for uh, to be very literal about it, low. Has, mo low, has more serotonin receptors than our brain. And that perhaps the reason for the delayed response to serotonin could be something to do with the drug's uh, interaction with our enteric nervous system, which is basically the, the group of nerves that govern the activity of our gut, which is starting to be considered now to be its own entity. For instance, if you took the gut out of somebody, so the bowel, the connection, say, from the stomach down, uh, it actually contracts by itself. It, it's almost like it's got its own central nervous system. That's called the myenteric nervous system. It's fascinating. It, it, it's like it's its own autonomous uh, creation or being. It's, it's fascinating. But just to go back to, like, the gut feeling people say they have. Yeah, I was just about like, to say that. Is there anything to that? There definitely is. The connection between the brain and the gut is profound. And like, sure, you see it when, you know, people are watching something or they say they've had a hugely emotional, traumatic event and they feel sick. They want to get sick. Yeah. That isn't a coincidence. It, it physically, tangibly, viscerally affects people. Something that was stimulating them on a cognitive or conscious component, mental, emotional component is now having a physiological effect in relation to the gastrointestinal system. And that's the second point I wanted to make about SSRIs. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> yeah, it, it really does. You know how everybody knows somebody who knows a benefit fraud? Like, you know, every, mm. everyone is like, oh, yeah, you, I saw this one guy on a train and he was saying that he was off to collect his dole money so that he could buy drugs with it. There's no yeah. way. Th or, or, for example, someone walks past a homeless person in the street and the, they give them money. And then two minutes later, they see the homeless guy getting out of a Lamborghini with a suit. Uh, yeah. You know, like all of these stories. And people take that one thing and go like, that's all of them for you. So people have these really horrible perceptions of um, anyone who collects benefits or anyone who is homeless. 
Uh, and then another thing to add to that is that people can go online and find all of their fears ultimately confirmed in a in a string of anecdotes from different forums across. Oh, that. I know. But I it know. doesn't give any context to the number of actual genuinely homeless people, which obviously vastly outweighs the number of scammers. But people have it in their head, like, oh well, they should just go and get a job because I saw it, like, and um, that's basically what I just did with SSRIs. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so that's a thing worth considering. I, I, I do sort of spend a lot of time talking about our inability to deal with statistics, and it's definitely a thing where I think I only quote statistics when they're in my favor. <laughs> Like, mm. uh, I'm definitely one of those types of people. Like, I'll tell you that Oasis are a better band than whoever they've sold more albums than. But if you tell me that Bon Jovi sold more albums than Oasis, that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't have any weight. Which I did do quite yeah. recently. Yeah, <laughs> that's why I used it as an example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah, no, uh, what was I going to say there? Um, yeah, no, just statistics. Yeah, we're just very cognitively cheap about kind of thinking things through. And, oh, yeah. So I don't know if you heard, but the UK recently apparently is rolling out a new welfare system. It's called it's Brexit. Not... Sorry, I'll, <laughs> I'll stop. It's not going to be means tested. So they're not going to have varying amounts of money given to people depending on what their needs are. It's going to be like a blanket payment. Hmm. But the problem with that is it only like, like it, it benefits the people who don't really need it. It hurts the people who actually needed the more money. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not saying that everyone's going to get the top tier amount. And like, I, I saw that they were like interviewing the public about it. And I think like 75% of the public said, this is ridiculous. Like, why are you giving someone who doesn't need as much money the same money, amount of money as somebody who needs more? And it's just such a lazy way to do it. You know what I mean? It's like, ah, oh, well, we can't be arsed working out how much you need or whatever. So we'll just give everyone the same. But there's always so much kind of could or fat associated with that. You know what I mean? Because then just... Th it's it's just not kind of thought through or from an administration point of view, it's not as rigorously kind of tested or decided on. I just think it's a really, really bad way of conducting something. I feel like I may lose listeners for saying this, but that kind of sums up the current UK government, really. Like, mm. that, that, like that's exactly the fucking level of thought I would expect from them. Um, mm. I don't know. Um, yeah, so I was, I was about to make a joke, uh, something to the effect, something to the effect of, like I wouldn't trust Dave Cameron to, like, as if I thought <laughs> that Dave Cameron was still the guy in charge. Like, I wouldn't trust yeah. it. But um, yeah, I I I think uh, I think I don't know. You only have to, it's it's basically like bad PR exercise after bad PR exercise for Theresa May's. Uh, yeah. Company, so. She's just a really bad leader. And actually, the qualities of leadership and stuff like that is a really interesting uh, topic from a psychological point of view. Like, who makes good leaders, who makes bad leaders? Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, we should actually probably go back and do that at some point because I have a lot to say about, like, polarizing figures from the past and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, really interesting. Um, so, should we move into social anxiety uh, and just yeah, cool. talking about what it is? Like, this is kind of a, this has become a very broad term um, that doesn't necessarily relate to social anxiety disorder, which is its own thing. It has a place in that, um, you might know what it's called, that DCSM 4 or DSM, yeah, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. I think 5 is coming out now. Yeah, there was so. A, there the, was a 4TO text revision that came out, but I think 5 is either in the works or is already out. Yeah, so this is like the Bible of mental disorders, basically, for doctors. It's a thing that they use. That uh, Each thing is like designated a series of symptoms or checklists. And uh, In America, though. So in Europe, we tend to use the World Health Organization classification, which is the ICD-10. Mm -hmm. it's, it's weird that there's actually two kind of... They're not opposing. They're often uh, parallel, but two very different classification systems in medicine in the Western world both the DSM-5 and the ICD-10. Yeah, like the DSM-5, I think, is kind of a better version. Um, a yeah. Anyone anyone interested uh, in that should read The Psychopath Test by John Ronson. It's a fantastic book. Um, but anyway, uh, just social anxiety in general is just the, I suppose, the general feeling of nervousness in any kind of social situation. I, that's, mm. I don't mean the disorder, I just mean... 
yeah 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 general social anxiety that's pretty much what it is and it's it's ve- it's very often like specific social situations and not broad social situations like exactly yeah so there are some circles in which you will find yourself as the dominant speaker and the funny guy and, and the person who kind of brings light into the room when you walk in and then there are others where you are just terrified of doing anything and if anyone's having trouble picturing that just think of the way that you are outside of school compared to how you are inside school and whether or not that's the same um because i know that in work i am a completely different person to how i am when i'm around my friends that i grew up with which is way different to how i am when i'm around my friends from the internet which is different to how i am when i'm around my friends that i went to college with and etc etc um everybody in every social circle there are different levels of i suppose characters or like there's like a hierarchy kind of structure and everyone has a role and your role may not be the same in everyone. Um, so, for example, someone might be really nervous about getting on a bus or getting off a bus, um, but they're totally fine walking into a restaurant and not knowing whether or not you're supposed to sit down yourself or wait for someone to sit you. And they're just totally mm. fine with that situation. It doesn't bother them at all. But the the whole thing about getting on a bus is that what if the route has suddenly changed? And um, mm. probably a bad example, but hey, uh, we're shooting from the hip here. Um, and that yeah. is a thing that like a lot of people nowadays uh, claim to suffer from, uh, which is kind of interesting because now is a time when the world is more connected than ever. Um, Mm -hmm. so it's and disconnected than ever as well in some weird way I don't know I always think that it's good to think of the flip side of that because I do think that we're at a a really weird existential state at the moment in the world where like virtual is sort of overtaking the real if that makes sense yeah absolutely in in some sort of real fundamental sense I I, I think that that's going on but it's, it's it's hard quite to quantify it so social anxiety often runs hand in hand with at least some form of depression even if it's just a mild depressive like sort of a low mood or just a general depressive view of the world or something like that it doesn't have to like some people mm-hmm. are very afraid of public speaking for example that's a form of social anxiety um but i think if you have like generalized prolonged social anxiety in a number of different uh, circumstances it's probably in some way related to an ongoing low mood or uh, a mild depression of some sort Um, yeah and also alcohol abuse is more common in social phobia than other phobias or like you know i mean uh, yeah yeah which is really interesting like the fact that people kind of self-medicate with alcohol in order to overcome it um yeah yeah, there is a lot to be said for Dutch courage and what that'll do for you. Um, yeah, yeah, and, and and that's the thing. Like, it does work, but obviously it comes with uh, insidious consequences that really do creep up on you and can cost you your job, your family life, your, your kids, you know what I mean? I wonder if um, that's why... Um, I wonder if it's a similar thing that leads schizophrenics to cigarettes, right? Because, like, apparently it's, it's like 100% of people with schizophrenia are smokers. Yes. Like, like, it, it's, like it's like, ridiculous, yes. Yeah, it's fucking outrageous. It's like an outrageously and, high number. Yeah, yeah. It's and I and, and I think you're right, it is self-medication. It, yeah. it basically, it calms them, they find it calming. And yeah. if you're schizophrenic, which is a, a really, really complex disease, um, really, really hard to tie down, really, really hard to give a good definition of, so I'd like to uh, advise kind of reading up on it or watching uh videos of it on youtube and, and and people explaining it but yeah self-medication with with cigarette with nicotine is definitely a real thing yeah watch me myself and irene i believe that's the most scientifically accurate depiction <laughs> so that's schizophrenia Slip, um, uh, that, i think that'd be more split personality you know yeah no i'm completely taking the piss um jim carrey's a cool guy <laughs> jim carrey <laughs> <laughs> jim carrey is a dude that that video keeps doing the rounds on Facebook. Jim Carrey has died, or so he says, or something like that. You know what I mean? Jim Carrey like, believes yeah. that you should not vaccinate your kids. Yeah, God love him. <laughs> yeah, he, I, yeah, I know, I know. But like, it's terrible because not only is that like kind of a hypothetical point of view where God will never see what it's like when people don't. You know what I mean? So maybe there's something to it, which is idiotic. But we're actually seeing what's happening in the likes of California, where you have these like 
ultra progressive moms and dads who are like, oh my God, like I'll just give him maple syrup when he gets meningitis. You know what I mean? Like absolute nonsense. And now kids are getting like mumps and like measles and stuff that we had eradicated. There's a, mum, only... there's a mumps outbreak in like Cork or something right now. Really? Yeah. I thought they just looked like that anyway. <laughs> I mean, actually we have listeners from there, so... Uh... Give it up for the real capital, am I right? (laughs) The real capital. Yeah. Yeah, so um, earlier, listeners, I received uh, an abusive comment on a video from two years ago from a guy who claimed that I was a typical Dubliner acting like I knew everything. So, for the record, Corkonians who were offended, I'm not from Dublin, so fuck off. Um, Yeah fucking hate that shit though like it, like it, yeah. it, it purely is some kind of weird um what's the word uh jesus what is that word? uh complex it, it's some weird complex about dublin that yeah like... it's an inferiority complex that isn't actually a real thing like you know what i mean yeah it's like kind of i you can see where they're coming from, though, because objectively Dublin has a lot of things that the rest of the country doesn't have. But it, yeah. it, it, it's like the whole notion of like white privilege or male privilege. Like they're, they're not actual things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they, they just don't exist in, in and of themselves. Like if you take an aggregate of certain amounts of people, sure, you'll find things that are different amongst, you know what I mean, sectors. But to say that that, uh, to presume you can infer anything about a particular person based on that is just bigotry yeah no that that's like that's like a really true part of it i i heard some example recently of somebody i don't know it, it part, we we're just out of halloween and the whole like you can't wear a halloween costume because that's racist oh my God. Type, type thing um what the joe fuck? rogan had a really good re- retort to that he's like the whole point of civilization is that you melt ideas with other ideas you melt identities you know what i mean it's a melting pot like that's where the term comes from i'm gonna say this right if you think wrestling is fake and that only idiots watch it because it's fake but you Mm -hmm. think that halloween costumes are racist that is there's some there's some something about that that's just a major conflict and you're a fucking idiot for thinking that and yeah often it is the people who are like oh wrestling is fake and it's for kids are the same people that are like this person dressed up as pocahontas that's appropriation of culture that's racist it's like that there's there's like i don't i can't really properly articulate it but i have it worked out perfectly in my head that that is just an outrageous conflict that you yeah, I, yeah. you know you can't it's just ah fuck off anyway it's an unresolvable cognitive dissonance yeah it is though it, like it totally fucking is yeah, I'm going to make a motion that we replace cultural appropriation with cultural appreciation. I honestly think that's the like most r- rational way to look at inverted commas appropriation. You're appreciating it. That you know is, I mean? gen- yeah, that's gen. Like, do you think Hillary Duff dressed up as Pocahontas because she fucking hates Native Americans? Like, or, does yeah, anyone exactly. believe that that's the act? Like. Like, come or on. The, or that she's thinking, oh my God, my life is as hard as Native Americans. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, seriously. Jesus. Come on. Like, yeah. I saw a video there recently of this. He was a Native American, actually, and he went to this group where these, they're basically hippies. Like, you know what I mean? Like, 50 year old hippies uh, standing around banging the drum and, and making noises that was somewhat, like, I suppose you could say was similar or akin to Native American uh, custom or tradition. And he was like, what do you think you're doing? And he thought he had the moral high ground in all this. And I was just kind of like, this is ridiculous. Um, like, you can't just go up to people who are doing something and be like, you know what, I'm the authority on this because look at my skin or look at my birth cert or look at my hair. Do you know what I mean? Like, who the fuck do you think you are? There's like a... I, I, I find this entire thing, the, the entire spectrum of identity politics at the moment, I find it to be really conflicting as an Irish person because if we're supposed to take the point of view that um, like black people have it worse, which like look like socially they often do in terms of the class that they're mm. in. I've said that before. Like it's I don't think it's a race issue. I think it's a class issue, and I think that it just happens that black people are in the lower class, and I think that's like long term. That's a result of Jim Crow. Like you can say whatever about the last like thirty years or twenty five years or whatever. But like I I do believe that that is how they got there, and I think that's a fine and defensible opinion to have. Um, right. But like 
there are there are black people in positions of privilege who get afforded the same levels of sympathy as those who are in the ghetto and you just would not do that with an irish person right so the new thing is to call conor mcgregor a, a bigot and a racist and a homophobe and a misogynist and all yeah. that stuff like right the dude's irish so like if when when floyd mayweather came out and called conor mcgregor a faggot nobody said anything about it and floyd mayweather was allowed to make an impassioned speech mm. about how the media mm. Uh, praises McGregor for doing things that he used to do, but they always criticized him for doing it. And exactly, there's no acknowledgement yeah. of the fact that he used to beat his wife or anything like that. Yeah, and yeah, like that's yeah. the reason why the media vilified him, where McGregor has done nothing to that level of, of bad, right? Like, yeah, how definitely. McGregor can't turn around and say, actually, Irish people have gone through even more historical abuse than black people, and you have yeah. American privilege. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, that's just not a thing. And that's because yeah. his skin is white. And I just think that it's retarded and it just makes the whole thing stupid. And nobody talks about that as a point because nobody really knows about Irish history. And I go on about it because I'm a little bit wounded because I lived in the UK and they didn't understand. And it just, it made me a little bit fucking, uh, I don't know, it, it, it tore away at me in some way. Um, but it's, it's just, it's fucking, there's like some Serbian band, right? They're a trad band. And they act like an Irish band. And, and if you just Google Star of County Down Serbia, you'll find the band. I forget what they're called. But their whole thing is that they, they are appreciating Irish culture. Um, and they mm. love it. And they fucking love everything about Ireland, right? And, like, we don't turn around to them and say, lads, you know nothing about being oppressed by the Brits for 800 years. So, like, stop yeah. ap appropriating our culture. No, we're like, oh, that's so cool. Another country is, is, like, they appreciate us. Like, we're friends in this way. There's, like, a thing in exactly. common there. Exactly. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, imaginary boogeyman. That's, I guess, um, yeah. a mental just appropriation. Like it's just, but like you never hear people being like, uh, "You're black. Why are you speaking English? Don't you know Afrikaans? You know what I mean?" Yeah. It's like, are you are you from England? Why the fuck are you appropriating English culture by speaking English? Or, uh, sorry, uh, are you a black woman with a, a straight hair wig? Uh, you're appropriating Caucasians. Like. Yeah, Call the, a spade a spade. The whole dreads thing, like, you can't have oh my dreads God. unless... Like, or hoop earrings now. But dreads don't even come from black culture originally, as far as I know. So I don't... It's just... It's just but a big pile of... This is what I call the bullshit of everything. This is where everything becomes a reason for somebody to have some kind of emotional reaction and one that we're supposed to listen to, right? And, yeah. like, I'm kind of, like, on board with that to a degree, too. Like, I actually kind of like political correctness, and, and it definitely just fucking aligns with my ideology so i'm totally biased in that way at least i understand my bias i suppose but the, the way that we're behaving now with giving all of these people like a platform after they get offended it's like it reminds me of like when you used to watch big brother when it first started back in like yeah. 99 or whatever and like this one person would be acting like a fucking dickhead and saying like you can't say that because it really offends me and the whole public yeah. would be like ah oh, shut the fuck up like now we're like letting that person win <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah. it's just i don't know it's it's a bad example but it's just something that irks me um no but it's true like the lunatics are actually running the asylum yeah like it's just so weird like, did you see there that the um the uk wanted the UN to remove the term pregnant woman from a charter because it excludes transgender people. That was the Tories trying to get in with the generation millennial or something. Good fucking look to the Tories trying to do that, by the way. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I have a lot of like different opinions about the transgender thing that I guess we're not going to solve in this episode, but... Mm. Um, I don't like the way transgender dysphoria is being used as like a, a piece in a proxy war between yeah. two conflicting ideologies right now. I don't think it's fair on people who suffer from that, like mental illness or like, you know, some people don't think it should be classed as a mental illness. It's not classed as one in terms of it's not in DSM-4, whatever um, no, I think it was in DSM four, but it's not in DSM five. Well, transgender, or, sorry, gender dysphoria is that that is a legitimate mental illness, and let's assume that every single transgender person suffers from that, right? That's a fucking horrible mental illness, and we have no way of, like, there's not beyond the whole sex change thing. There's actually not really a way of dealing with that because mental health is so underfunded in the states. So, like, yeah. Anyway, I've I've said this before, and it's completely off topic, and we've been derailed, but. 
I, I just hate the way it's like, oh, well, it's We've mental We've been de-signed up. So shut the fuck up. Yeah, I've been de-signed up. Um, um, I just don't like the fact that children are suffering at the hands of our own inability to talk about these things in an adult uh, in, intellectual and rational way, you know what I mean? Like we have kids now who are being put on hormones. We have kids now who are being mutilated. Like if a kid can't drink a, a glass of beer, how can it consent to undergoing life-changing surgery? Yeah, like you're, you're, like, yeah. That that's definitely a topic for another day. But it's, yeah, it's definitely yeah. like I I do pretty much agree with that. Like there should definitely be an age that you have to like there's an yeah like the, the same with like breast augmentation like it, it almost seems now like it would be harder to get breast <laughs> implants as a teenage girl than it would be to turn into a boy or vice versa you know what i mean yeah but i know it's uh, the american pediatric association came out there recently and sort of said here listen we really need to cut the put the brakes on what we're doing here and i don't think it was really taken too well i'll say this too though um the, i i think they are equally wrongly administering um other drugs to kids that they shouldn't yeah have. definitely so like it, ritalin and yeah yeah it's, it's not just drugs. a gender issue it's an actual like there is a serious problem with big pharma just well that is a gender issue in an indirect way i think i think there's a feminization of young people i think that we want boys to sort of in school and in certain environments be a bit more like girls because girls i think on average are a bit more predictable a bit more agreeable a bit more uh kind of socially conforming i think boys are boisterous they're aggressive they're loud you know what i mean i think they're qualities that while i think they're important i just don't think today's society values them as much as they should and i think they try and shun that sort of behavior and i really think we're going to look back on what we're doing now in like in line with the likes of okay over medicating boys with ritalin and kind of shake our heads yeah i mean i can't really say much about that because i don't i do i do definitely see that there is like a cultural attempt to feminize men um as like a as a very effeminate male like myself i'm definitely not like uh externally feminine right i don't look feminine or anything but i definitely that's have butt. yeah well that's that new. big bodacious badonkadonk <laughs> yeah no that is definitely a, a source of much wolf whistling from uh unassuming <laughs> builders but um but I... then you just drop the pants a little bit and throw it <laughs> off and that usually suffices to uh, satiate them for another day yeah so be it that's the way it goes um, yeah, baby. <laughs> but I do have a lot of like feminine qual. Like I, I am a very feminine male, definitely. I'm, I'm like overly sensitive. Ah, you're not. You're not. I fucking am though. Like uh, you're not. You're, you're you're just a caring, considerate guy, which by today's standards makes you effeminate. You're not. A, you're not effeminate. Like you're you're a hunk. <laughs> you're a modern John Wayne. Uh, John Wayne was a white supremacist. Was he? Yeah, he actually genuinely was. So he actually had one thing right. Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) I like that on my podcast, you can actually make that joke and it won't ruin the rest of your life. (laughs) Um, Yeah, yeah. But like, uh, yeah. Like, imagine imagine if that did ruin someone's life. Like, I just hate that. mm. Like, it it annoys me to the point of, shit, I feel like I want to make more jokes like that because... That, right, that is a really weird thing that uh i don't yeah that tendency yeah i don't understand that and like i i genuinely don't think that i have much of that in me i definitely have it when it comes to like anti-establishment stuff like if... anti-establishment sorry not established authority Character culture. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah yeah if you're if... the new punk rock i am the old punk rock punk rock is you're the new punk me rock <laughs> do you hear what i just a great quote i'm the old punk rock punk rock is the new me mm. Who, like, whose was that I made it up right now, but it's, it means nothing sounds great. That's my favorite. Yeah, yeah, That's my yeah. favorite kind of mantra is one that means nothing and sounds great. Um, kind of like the new U2 stuff. Yeah, Songs of Innocence. Ugh, make, like, it actually makes me want to get sick. I know. Such Just, a... like, imagine being that deluded that you think you can create an album called that. It's like creating an album being like, 
songs to live by. Do you know what's so <laughs> funny, right? Is that they that album was supposed to come out in like I know in like was it like November last year, and then they yeah, were like, oh well, with Trump won. being with with Trump being elected, we're gonna just hold off and just wait until it's a more poignant time. Appropriate time. It's yeah. like, lads, nobody fucking cares about this album. Like, but sure, they're the album before they had to like upload secretly onto everyone's iTunes account. Ah, oh, they. Oh, they yeah. just are such a fucking embarrassment of a band. Like, I think, yeah, they are an embarrassment. I think they're extraordinarily talented. I think they've got, like, some absolute belters of songs, unreal albums. Like, yeah, I think look, Alton they're U2. They, like, they invented yeah. Stadium Rock. Like, But they, it's their obliviousness to their own cringe that just makes them even more cringe. There's a great... Um, do, do you know, are you familiar with Pitchfork? The um, Sure, it's what I turn my hay with. I knew that you would do that. Uh, you are a man who will make a pun out of anything before anyone has even made it, or a wordplay joke. Or a... <laughs> That's a mental illness, by the way. I haven't classified it, 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 it yet. It but... is associated with mania. Yeah. Excessive punning. Wrestle mania. Um, but uh, no, so Pitchfork Media are this uh, alternative sort of indie um like fanboys. They're, they're, they're a, a publication company that review music, basically, and they give like shitty lo-fi indie music like 10 out of 10s and they piss all over anything really good right so, so like mm. Coldplay for example would never do well on a place like Pitchfork or, or U2 or bands like that like Radiohead would because they're cool enough you know in the in the indie circle the um, best part of all time well mm, uh, but anyway <laughs> uh, fucking Pitchfork readers are very much their head is inside of their own anus and mm. um I I actually subscribed to Pitchfork for what it's worth, so I say that in jest. But um, there was an interview with you two on there, and at the very end of it, after Bono talked an unholy amount of shite, said one thing I just want to end with is I, I I really like the way your readers sort of let their own music taste come to the like you know they're only interested in the music and how it sounds, and we really respect that. And oh, the even funnier thing about it is that the comments on the video, this was uploaded to their YouTube channel, the comments on the video are like, I like what he said at the end, that was pretty good. Overall, he seems like a good guy and all. It's like, <laughs> you fucking idiots, he's playing you. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, yeah. Anyway, listen, we've gotten way off topic. They played us like a damn fiddle. <laughs> <laughs> no, Metal Gear Solid 5, no. Played us like the... Oh, no, that was uh, Grand Zeroes. Yeah, I never actually played Grand. I did play it, I didn't complete it. But yeah. um, Kaz, I think, is like the coolest character in Metal Gear Solid Five. Revolver Ocelot should have been fucking cooler than he was. He was like a wet blanket. It was ridiculous. Is this you just taking the podcast to? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Me. We've gotten off topic. You. Revolver Ocelot was underutilized in MGS Five. <laughs> he was. He was. It makes me sad. Shala um, Yeah. Yeah, so listen, social anxiety. Jesus, can we fucking get back? Is it even possible to rescue this from here, or should we just talk about it? Definitely. No, uh, social anxiety, yeah. Uh, yeah. Listen, if you suffer from social anxiety, right, do you want to say anything about it, John, from like a neurological point of view? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think for young guys especially, um, so there's, there's obviously that sort of cliche of guys aren't in touch with their feelings and that. Okay, for one, I'd say that that's complete bullshit. If we look at suicide rates, men are predominantly the most affected across many, many countries. So clearly, we are feeling, we are hurting. And unfortunately, we're acting on it often in the wrong way. Is, is so it please... not accurate to say, though, that men are not in touch with their feelings? Like, they, they are feeling, yeah, but they can never sort of point them in one particular direction. Like, do you, do you think well, that... it's, But I don't think that's fair, though, because... I'll, why are men killing themselves? It's pointing them in a direction. It's pointing them in a terrible direction. It, yeah, no, I, I agree 100%. I, I just think there's something... Like, what, that... what, the conclusion, I think, of men have feelings, but they don't know what, would be that it's it's a scattered plot where men are just all over the place. But men aren't. But, you know but I mean? that's, really... that sounds a lot like anxiety to me. Well, no, well, anxiety, as far as I know, in essence, doesn't have a negative mood aspect. It has a autonomic sort of stress aspect. So the difference between stress and low mood is, you know, when kind of work is really busy, you're like, holy shit, I can't get on top of it. You don't feel sad per se, but you feel stressed. You feel kind of like um, your own capacity isn't sufficient for the amount of work that needs to be done. 
Yeah, plus um, to to go back at my own point as well, um, some of the most expressive men uh, like have committed like like some of the most expressive men in pop culture in history have committed suicide. Like Chester Bennington, exactly. Like to say that this guy did not know what to do with his feelings is, is exactly. ridiculous because it's right there in his lyrics. So yeah. But like, look at all the famous artists over the centuries who were male and who ki- killed themselves. Like it's it's I, I think it's it does men in a, a severe injustice. Like oh, you just really you just can't cope with your feelings or you just don't know how to interact with them and all this. It's like no no no, we know what's going on. Maybe it's the fact that you keep telling us that that make us feel like we second guess our feelings you know what i mean i just think that if there is anyone listening who is suffering at the moment have someone to talk to anyone if you have to go to friends please go to friends if you have to go back to family if you have family there like a mother or father brother sister anybody at all talk to someone family are great because for what it's worth you do have a bond there that isn't arbitrary you know what i mean people do stick with their family and I I can talk from my own experience that I'm really lucky that I have a really good family behind me that I could talk to about things like that but just talk to someone and if you can't find someone to talk to then pay to talk to someone go to counseling find it where there's free counseling services near you they can put you in contact with other people find what free resources there are near you just talk talking is, is, is so important I'd like to add that John's family are all right, but not that great. So I... <laughs> they're about a six. Yeah, they are. They're about a six. Yeah. I, I like now to contextualize that. I'd say mine is about a five point five. So not great either. But uh, John is definitely overhyping his family there, which is not. And Elton Nero's mom makes up about five points on that five point five. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Um, so. Um, I would like to share some tips on how to cope with social anxiety or, or even just low mood in general. Um, mm. Some really cool stuff that I learned that you can actually teach yourself to do um, cool. with, with social anxiety if you're afraid. And this is this is like it's pretty intuitive stuff. Uh, it's it's right there in line with get over it if you have depression, but it is proven to work if you suffer from social anxiety, like about say getting on a bus for example um like deliberately set yourself the goal of getting off the bus at the wrong stop so where you usually get off the bus and if if you're like palms are sweaty about this every day when it comes up to your stop and you know you have to press the button and get off get off at the stop after get off at the stop before and do that a few times so that you become comfortable with the idea of getting off at the wrong stop and what you do as you do that every time you train your brain to understand that it's not that big a deal if you get off at the wrong stop you just have to walk a little bit longer that's all um yeah we'll fully appreciate that that is a really impossible sort of place to get to as you start off but um if you can do anything else like that that will sort of break down the thing that makes it difficult for you in social situations. Another cool thing to do that's actually quite easy and you'll find that it has an immediate effect is when you're walking down a really busy street, look at everyone in the eye. Like every single person that walks past you, like make eye contact with that person. It just immediately yeah. breaks down a wall. Um, if you feel like profiling for the sake of your own safety, definitely do it. Don't look at a you know person who looks like a criminal right in the eye. Um, like if someone's you know got their tracksuit bottoms tucked into their socks, or in the black and white stripe or the yellow jumpsuit, or yeah, any, yeah, 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 you don't want to make eye contact with those people. But for mm. real though, just look people in the eye. Um, it's quite interesting. That's really good advice. Yeah, yeah. I had to do this thing recently. Um, I just started a new job at a tech startup, so it's super cool. It's super like um, hip. Yeah, super hip. Anti corporate. Uh, anti corporate. That's a new one. Anti <laughs> anti corporation. Like all of that stuff. And one of the things that we had to do on our first day was um, this was just an exercise in showing how much personal information you can get out of a person. And uh, we had to go up to someone in the street, ask them what they were doing that night, and then ask them why five times. So you ask them a, th- a thing, what are you doing tonight? Why, 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 why? Um, I'm not telling anyone to do that, but I'm just saying that this information was really, really easy to get. And one thing that it showed me is that people on the street are actually like really normal and uh, they're all just like you. And a lot of them... I I think if you suffer from social anxiety, you sort of have the impression that everyone around you has their lives together. And um, if you were to just talk to like even one person, you'd realize that, I mean, they're human just like you and they feel things just like you. 
Um, so these things are good. Um, if you feel like really down about yourself and you feel like, oh, I'm an idiot, I can never be this good at anything, um, what you need to do is get yourself um, like an A4 notepad and mm -hmm. title it, I am good enough because and write down a couple of reasons why every day you adequately performed <laughs> like to like, adequately performed the bare minimum that was expected of you that day it doesn't have to be like employment or school or, but like literally anything you did that was sufficient that was fine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um like you know i got off the bus at the right stop today like that's literally all it has to be or mm -hmm. i got on the bus without like looking at someone in like a a any of this kind of thing it, it can be literally anything and all you have to do is just sum up why you adequately are fine and mm. what that will do is just normalize your experience and it will make you feel like you're not actually beneath uh, everybody um mm -hmm. but those are just some cool things that i learned um that i think a lot of people listening would be able to benefit from because <clears throat> for whatever reason a lot of people who are subscribed to me have social anxiety i've made like loads of videos about anxiety before and i always got like really positive feedback so um, I feel like there's a lot of people out there that will listen to that advice and be like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but the writing down how you're adequate, like it's it's just like literally that's all you have to do is achieve some standard of averageness and yeah. you'll just feel better. You'll be like, I'm a normal person. I can you'll never feel like you're a normal person because no one's a normal person. No one feels like they are a normal person. But you know what I mean? It'll just make you feel like you belong in some way. And one more thing. Push yourself within your own value structure, something that means something to you. We've no way yet of kind of quantifying um, the ceiling of human potential. So essentially, you cannot fail. You can only succeed. So just push yourself within your own value structure. Yeah. They, like, I, they, like this advice will literally improve lives. I, I yeah. genuinely believe that. Um, Hopefully. Yeah. So... um. I feel like we should probably end on that note because that was really empowering, and um, I I think that in 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 this weird digital half virtual world that we're in, um, mm. everything results in an existential crisis. There are so many times you can look at the news and whatever's flashing through the fifteen minute news cycle will make you say, "I don't want to live on this planet anymore," um, and it, it like. It, it it's really really weird it's a really weird time to be alive i'm sure everyone has said that in, in every era right in every decade but there is something especially odd about the fact that we may well be sharing the planet with artificial intelligence soon or we may well be looking at nuclear fallout from the north korea like yeah it it's a fucking insane time to be alive and and just lots of things make you panic and lots of things make you anxious and lots of things sort of send you into that existential like dread cycle of uh, having to look at your timeline and shake your head and write out a tweet about everything you think in the world and then delete it because no one cares anyway and all of that stuff. And um, you don't have to be a part of that death spiral. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, you're uh, you're better than that. So. I think that was a great way of finishing it off. Hell yeah, it was.
disappear in time one time as sooner or later I will I'll be dead and gone but the music will always remain you know there, there might be some kid a hundred years from now that'll put it on and go man I really like what they were doing that back then and it can translate then so you know it's, it's bigger than all of the music is not our music specifically just anyone who creates music it's bigger than you